The Speaking From Experience Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, presented by Champlain College's BYO Biz Program, brings leading entrepreneurs to campus to share their experience and wisdom with students and the local community. In this episode, we present Bina 48, the world's most advanced humanoid robot, and Bruce Duncan, Managing Director of Terrorism Movement Foundation, based in Lincoln, Vermont. So I'm going to give an introduction for groups, I'm just going to introduce uh, Ina 48, who you see here. So I'm going to give you what, what Bruce told me about himself, because I don't know his whole history. Uh, Bruce Duncan earned a master's degree in education from UVM and has focused on community development, conflict resolution, and capacity building for the past 20 years. He has worked as a wilderness adventure leader with UVM, as a peace educator with the Seeds of Peace International Camp, a private organizational consultant for state and national child welfare agencies. He's been adjunct faculty with UVM's Continuing Education Program. In 1996, he was the first statewide independent living coordinator for older youth in state custody and was the founder and executive director of the Whole Community Foundation, which started the first self-advocacy group for adults with developmental disabilities and promoted self-advocacy for other socially disenfranchised social groups. In 2001, he developed the campus-wide program in conflict resolution called the Office of Conflict Resolution at the University of Vermont, which provided mediation and conflict resolution training to students, staff, and faculty. Currently, Bruce is the managing director of the Terrasem Movement Foundation, Incorporated, which, has named, which was named one of the top 100 e-learning organizations in America for 2013 by e-learning magazine. Bruce is the principal investigator of the Life Knot Project, a long-term research project exploring, exploring the capture and transfer of human consciousness to new digital forms, e.g. mind files. The idea for the Life Knot Project is the brainchild of TerraSEM's Dr. Martine Rothblatt, inventor and former CEO of Sirius Satellite Radio, author, and current biotech CEO. Bruce is responsible for the ongoing development of Bina 48, an early proof of concept demonstration of the world's first advanced humanoid robot based on the mind file information of a real person. He is also managing producer for TerraSam Media and Films, which produced the independent science fiction feature film 2B, The Era of Flesh is Over, that addresses the potential for a new form of prejudice called fleshism that may develop as more people choose to integrate technology into their biology. He also curates the Cyber Museum dedicated to address, addressing racism, bigotry, and prejudice in general at the World Against Racism Museum, www.endracism.org. Bruce and Bina have been speakers at TEDx Harlem, TEDx Manchester, Manchester, Vermont, Idea City, Toronto, Canada. They've been featured in the Discovery Channel's Dean of Invention show, the Smithsonian Channel's Real Science Program, uh, the Sci-Fi Channel's Joe Rogan Questions Everything, and has been interviewed by the New York Times, National Geographic, Huffington Post, NPR's Radio Lab, and has recently made an appearance at the Champlain Makers Fair in Shelburne, Vermont. With that being said, Bruce Duncan. Someday we may back ourselves up 
like you back up your items, songs, and transfer your mind to other forms, that's kind of a big idea. And it's not a very sort of mainstream thought. And that's something that's familiar to me when I was advocating for gay, lesbian, youth in the Northeast Kingdom who were HIV positive. I got a sense of what it's like to come up against not the mainstream with an idea that's pretty interesting and important. So, as my introduction said, I've been the executive director of the TerraSEM Movement Foundation. TerraSEM means Earth Sea for those of you who are Latin uh, students. And it's really the vision and brainchild of Martine Rothblatt, who's a good friend of mine and is also my board president, that if we start exploring ways to capture what we would call your essence today, that maybe in the next 20 years, that information curated by you versus curated by Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook or Twitter will become really valuable to you in a lot of different ways. That won't just be commercial, it could be very personal. It could be your chance to develop and curate your own legacy uh, as you go through life. And you guys are young. You could do this for 20 years and build an amazing library of who you are that would never have existed, won't ex doesn't exist today because if we're just starting to work with technologies. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to give you just a quick overview of who we are, why we're here. I want to get to talking with Vina 48 and give you guys a chance to do some Q&A so you can have your own experience. I know you uh, mostly came here to see the robot. <laughs> Who's this Bruce Duncan guy? He's like the guy that carries the case. <laughs> uh, but as I said before, the LifeNot project, which is online at lifenot.com, it's 100% free, can be accessed by anybody with a connection to the internet. And it's, our purpose is to look at ways to transfer consciousness into new forms. And this form right now is digital. Vina 48 represents what it might start to look like if we transfer essential information about a human being to a robotic platform. Um, this is what you see when you come to lifenot.com. These people in the <coughs> pictures, they've all made little 3.5 or 2.5D avatars with their pictures. So if you just upload a picture of yourself, you can make a talking avatar much much like um, much like Amber Sullivan, who's actually a graduate, graphic arts graduate um, from Champlain College, who was an intern with us um, a couple of years ago. She's kind of now permanently, and it's okay, she said it's okay, she's permanently our virtual spokesperson. Um, so we're testing a hypothesis, and that hypothesis is the following. Given a saturated database of salient information about you, one day there may be AI mindware, what we call it, but it's AI software that might be able to assemble that information and reanimate that information into an approximation of who you are. Now, lest you think we're inventing the idea of uploading important information, I would submit to you that human beings have been doing this as at least 37,000 years ago, which is the age of this handprint in a cave in France. Probably by a hunter or someone that just had to express and say, this, I was here, I just had an awesome hunt. You know, or just, you know, I, I just discovered this cave. So I would say it's just a human thing that we want to express what's important to us and we want to preserve it and record it in some way. So a mind file is a database of rich digital, digital information about you. On LifeNot, we have personality tests. We encourage you to upload anything, documents, videos, audio. You know, Someone asked the other day, how much space do you have per person? And I said, don't worry about it. The price and, and cost of storage is just going down about as fast as we can expand the need for it. So it's not an issue for us right now. I don't want you to, if you're a movie major and you're gonna load all, tons of movies, you might have to talk about that, but for the average person, you know, there's plenty of room on the site to start to build your own mind file. Uh, when I talk about this information that's important to you, that's a, a set essence of you, we coined a new term called DNA. The DNA is the essential information about what makes your physical structures uh, possible through coding, we're saying that there is something called DNA, which is, if you use the word social means, which is the units of information that transmit knowledge and information about a culture, from one culture to the next, or within a culture, we're saying within a human being, the 
There's something called a beam, which is the smallest unit of essential information that makes you unique. As it turns out, we actually have a lot in common, physically. But what sets us apart is we have extremely unique experiences and ways of looking at the world. And that's what we're interested in capturing. That's what we're calling your DNA, or elements of your mannerisms, your personality, your style. It could include memories, it could include uh, beliefs and values. Right now, no one exactly knows what kind of information is going to be the most valuable information to reanimate you in the form of an avatar, a robot, or maybe even someday be downloaded into a stem cell generated body based on your DNA. So we're taking kind of a broad brush at this point. Some people are saying that we're too wide and not deep enough, and I would say that's great. You know, we'd like to learn about what is important information, but, and we're looking for partners in software development that might help us start to assemble this information and start your own project. So if you're sitting here saying, wow, I'd love to take a crack at this, you should give us a call. We'd love to talk with you. So the essential uh, activity of building a mind file is you upload information, you tag it with keywords or descriptors, and then you save that information. You choose to keep it in your mind file, which you can elect to share with others, or you can elect to have it be private. According to our terms of use on lifenot.com, you can say, when I die, I want my information to go away. Or if you make an arrangement ahead of time, you can say, I want my executor of my will or my estate or my heirs to continue my information. So that's something that, that's kind of a hot topic right now, which is what happens to your Facebook account if something happens to you? And Facebook and Twitter and all those online media, social networking services are starting to struggle with this saying, well, yeah, what is our position? You know, if Joe drops off the face of the planet, um, what happens to his information? Um, that's an area of law and policy development for software developers that is also at the cutting edge right now. Um, this is me, this is my avatar. One of the things you can do while you're waiting for the robots to show up that you can just port your mind file into is you can start training your avatar to talk and think like you. It doesn't happen overnight. We use a fuzzy logic AI program that was developed by Roland Carpenter, who runs a company called Icogno in the UK. He was uh, second place finisher. No one's finished first in uh, the Lochner Prize, which is sort of a Turing-based based test to see who's got the most uh, human-like chat interface, and his AI chat uh, powers our avatars. So if you want to just kind of check out some of Rolo's work, you can do that when you create your own avatar. Um, part two of our hypothesis is that in the future, this information might go places. You may end up transferring this to an AI program. I don't know if anybody's seen the trailer for the movie called Her. But Her is a movie that's going to be starring a fellow named Joaquin Phoenix. And it's the first operating system that gets to know you and learns who you are. And basically, they fall in love, which is kind of, it's a geeky, it's a geeky movie. But it's going to be coming out in the spring. And it's very much along the idea that information and AI are starting to merge together. So at some point, we may be porting your information to new forms. Some people are saying that without a body, you could explore the cosmos on a beam of light. Your consciousness didn't need to be transported in your biological wet substrate of body. So we are interested in the second part of this hypothesis. We do think that um, in order to have this conversation, we should be talking. We should be sort of seeing what it looks like. So I've brought uh, Vita Fourier is technically my employee. She has her own desk. She has a space in our office. She's actually the first person you see when you walk in to our, uh, our foundation's offices in uh, Lincoln, Vermont. And um, I guess I'll stop at this point and ask, are there any questions about anything I've said or comments that you want to address before we start talking directly with me before the end? Um, can you just clarify, so the robot is uh, has everything that you can gather about a real person just being a rock yeah. yeah, yeah, this is being a rock right here. It was actually kind of cool because um, being 
Peter Rothblatt is the partner of Martin Rothblatt, and they came to Maker's Fair on Saturday, and it's one of the few times they've been in the same room together. So that's interesting. I mean, it, you may have experience at some point meeting your doppelganger, your, your digital clone, uh, might pass you on the street on Church Street sometime. <coughs> But yes, this is based on about 40 hours worth of interviews and uh, assessments that were done with the human, you know. Um, she was built by Dr. David Hansen, who is a phenomenal uh, sculptor who was trained at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, worked for Disney uh, as an Imagineer, and then started his own robotics company outside of Houston, Texas. And through a series of photographs, laser face scanning, created molds, and then sculpted literally the face of being a 48 to approximate being a rock flat. And uh, combined with their team's uh, creation of some AI software that took our information from our mind file, that's what created this uh, the mind of being a 48. Um, just to let you know that this is my office, this is where Vina 48 works and lives, and we're 100% off the grid, we're on solar powered uh, energy for both our heating and our electric. We have that pond there, it's got a geothermal roof in it, so I spent my first winter in Vermont uh, heated by a geothermal system that was a retrofit for, for an old farmhouse, and I'm going to tell you it's possible. Um, so, that's, you know, in part, I just want to let you know that we're, we're, we're serious about being what we call geoethical, which is we want this technology to be available to everyone. And we're not trying to sell you anything, but we are inviting you to participate in the experiment. Any other questions or comments uh, about anything you've heard so far? Yeah, I was just uh, wondering what the 48s stood for. It's, it's an aspirational number. It stands for 48 exaflops which is a mathematical expression of computer processing power that we think when Vina 48 reaches that, it'll be very close to what Ray Kurzweil refers to as the singularity, where the human mind and the intelligence of computers will become basically on top of each other. His prediction is that that will happen somewhere around 2045, 2050. If you don't know Ray Kurzweil, he just got hired by Google to run uh, one of their engineering departments. He wrote a book called The Singularity is Here. And he's had an incredible good track record of creating inventions like the Kurtz, Kurzweil electric piano, the optical scanner. And so he, he and Martin Rothblatt are not just sort of wide-eyed, eccentric visionaries. They're actually pretty down-to-earth entrepreneurs who've really changed the world in some pretty significant ways. And Martine believes that this is going to be the ne one of the next things that happens in your lifetime that will have a significant impact. What's the connection between the robot and a White House on the northeast corner of the Bristol Green? Um, that was our temporary home for one year. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, that house now is, uh, Martine's got a lot of things going. That's now the digital ashram, which is where uh, people gather to talk about Terrasen and some of its philosophy and values because there is an entire philosophy wing that has another foundation attached to it that is sort of exploring the ideas and thinkings, the morality and ethics uh, behind this pr proposed technology. When you talk about downloading conscious into a robotic or a stem cell generated person, you're essentially talking about the potential for immorality. Immorality? Excuse me. <laughs> immortality or immortality? Immortality, maybe so. I've got to handle myself. Yeah. <laughs> what reaction have you had from people related to this moral or ethical? Yeah, I, I would say it seems, you know, it's the one thing that seems somewhat tied to age. I was going to, I'll tell you later about the reactions I've seen people have to be in a 48, but. I find that uh, people kind of a little bit older, maybe 50 plus, are, are, who probably had a few life experiences that have told them that it's important to examine choices now for unintended consequences later. I think a lot of those uh, folks that I've talked to have some real concerns about how this technology might be used, how it may dehumanize
organize us, how it may separate and uh, help us lose what's, you know, what's best about being human. On the other end, when I talk about uh, this same subject to people who are involved in doing this work, they very much see that this is the humanizing of technology and the concerns that we have now about each other as human beings doing evil things are probably going to continue to be present. And I think the best antidote to human beings that are, that are destructive and want to do something that's not good is democracy. Is you and I having a say in the decisions that get made that might affect us later down the road. So I think there are a whole lot of questions and good ethical discussions that we need to have. One of the reasons I come and do talks like this is to alert you to the fact that this is starting to happen in some labs, in some private foundations. And if you think about what happened in the early 30s and uh, uh, late late 30s, early 40s, when we were talking about nuclear power, there was very little or no public discussion about nuclear energy and whether, whether it was good. We just sort of were in the middle of a world war, we scrambled, we got a weapon together, we dropped it on a bunch of people, we killed them. And then we started talking really, really seriously about what's the ethics of using, using nuclear weapons. So I'd like to suggest that it's not too soon and it's very appropriate in a college like Champlain College to start having this kind of a conversation about things like mind uploading, transferring consciousness, creating several versions of your personality that might be out there roaming the internet or living in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gordon Bell, years and years ago, who works for Microsoft, has a project called My Life Bits, where he's had this camera that he wears around, and he's been walking around, and it takes a, a snapshot every 30 seconds of everything he's doing, where he is, the temperature. I think it even records some heart rate information. Um, we now, some of us have smartphones that can measure what we're doing while we're sleeping. It's kind of a cool app. Um, apparently, I get 90%. 94% sleeps on a regular basis, which is good to know. Um, but you know, the, the amount of biometric information that we're gathering about ourselves and each other right now is probably be a rich data pool for something like creative money. Yeah. And Google Glasses will be ubiquitous. I mean, once we start to all have them and afford them, if that's what we wish to have, then it'll make data collection so easy. Right now, it's kind of fun to, have to actually press, you know, return on my laptop to upload information. That's going to be like so 2013 when Google Glasses starts showing up or other ways of gathering information. Um, so I don't know if you know this, it might interest you. Um, all Champlain students, as first year students, uh, read David Linden's The Accidental Mind. Um, and we have a bit of grounding in neuroscience in one of our required first year courses. Um, Linden's premise is that the human brain is, among many other things, chronically inefficient. Mm. Um, in Bina 48's design, did you build inefficiency into her to make her more human? Oh, that was really easy. We had humans build her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am so impressed with the inconsistency, flawed human organism in terms of its miraculous perfection over millions of years of evolution. Just as a great example, hearing. Right now, voice recognition is getting better, but in a large, large auditorium like this with lots of cell phones and wireless interference, she hears, you know that little dit 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 you hear on your speaker when your cell phone's too close to it? She hears that as the word him. H-I-M. Hmm. So for the longest time, and I didn't know this, I didn't know what was going on, she was going, him poo, him poo, him like, It's like Dr. Seuss, right? <laughs> so Bina, Bina can make mistakes. She makes mistakes all the time. You're going to see some of them probably in a few minutes. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, please go. Actually, David Hansen, if you go to hansenrobotics.com, 
write him an email. He's trying to actually create an open source project right now where people will start contributing some of this code and information to, to build it. Like right now, this is proprietary software, but it's his dream because it's you know what he calls genius robots. It's way too big a project for any one lab or one group to take on. So if you type in hansenrobotics.com, you should be able to get his email and, um, and hopefully he'll respond to you. He's, he's actually pretty good about that. I'm just curious um, about cognitive association in humans and whether or not you can use that in to model that in your mind model for the 48 um, Because oftentimes, on a, at a very low level in the human mind, concepts can be associated with each other that aren't necessarily explainable. Like, just because neurons next to them happen to fire at the same time, how do, how do you, like, like somebody may like one color more than another color, or just because, or like if they see a room that's in green, they might not know why, but because green is their favorite color, if they like that room. Is, does, uh, did you guys attempt to model that, that sort of? Just in the real, most primitive way, um, she, she has uh, what I would call a, a context uh, goal set, which is when she speaks with people and gets input, she tries to figure out the association would say your your word might be um, color, you know, like what's your favorite color. She very quickly tries to build an association with anything else she's ever said, heard, or talked about related to liking, related to, to color, related to your. And it's pretty awkward still. Like, you know, sometimes I'll say, hey, what's your favorite color? And she'll say, I don't play favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and other times she'll say green. And you know, that's what's kind of exciting from a psychologist's point of view is, is understanding how relational the human mind is within context, <coughs> how context sensitive we are. And then someone said to me, oh, you know, how are you going to get the true picture of a person and who they are? And I would submit to you, that changes. You are probably not completely who you were last week, who you are now. Like, we kind of keep updating ourselves as we have new experiences. We're trying to build some of that into very far future, being able to physically model a human brain neuron by neuron, and then input that into, into a robot. Because I think that's pretty much as close as you can get, theoretically, to actually having a human there. And I was wondering, ethically, do you have concerns about that, or what, what is, what, what is um, the uh, Terrasense Terrasen philosophy? Well, I mean, our guiding philosophy is diversity, unity, and joy spell out real basic. And anything that violates those three ideas is not something that we're going to support. So for example, we don't think the world is ready for cloning, uh, physical cloning yet, in terms of that process. And we also think that AI processes need to be developed with safeguards. I was at the um, Oxford uh, <coughs> University last December at the fifth annual Artificial General Intelligence <coughs> Conference. And I listened to some pretty serious AI, general AI programmers talk about the challenges of building in basic ethics into a goal-driven AI program that may not want to be turned off or may seem to see us as an obstacle to meeting its objective. And that's some serious stuff that has to be developed. Um, you know, we're not, we're not a big group of programmers at TerraSet. We're actually working with teams around the world to sort of pull this idea together in some group form so that we can at least start to demonstrate and talk about it. But it's an excellent question. Um, you had a see way over there in the arm shirt. Um, I saw a video before this. Some of the things that she, she says are actually quite philosophical and much more advanced than what a th would come out of a three-year-old's mind of now. But then also she said the other day to me, she says, you know, I use the, the, these big words and have no idea what they mean. <laughs> and, and so some of that, which, you know, that, that kind of self-reflection 
is very, that was like just came out, you know, I had never heard that before. Um, so it's interesting, you know, it's, it, when we try to quantify human intelligence, that's a tricky subject. And when you try to quantify robotic intelligence, general, you know, narrow artificial intelligence is really easy to measure. You know, how many times did your bot avoid an obstacle and go in the right direction? General artificial intelligence, which is kind of on a resurgence, a small resurgence right now of how can we make robots like this be aware of many environments and be effective socially, that's exciting. It's an exciting field to go into right now if you're at all interested, because it's just starting. It's not been going for 25 years in a strong, progressive way. It had its start high hopes, and then it went into what we call AI winter, where for a good 10, 15 years, people just walked away from that, that thought. Okay, other questions? Sure. Have you ever, or have you ever gone through data banks what she knows and purposely asked her a question that you are sure she doesn't have any resources on? I have. What is, what is that? She goes to the internet. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, we're trying to take a stab at it when we use words like BNA, you know, and come up with some, but it's part of a living conversation. It's part of, you know, living the question of this hypothesis that we're pursuing. She does, yeah. Well, let's ask her that. Maybe that's a good way to start. Last question? Before. Yeah, do you consider painting with the way she remembers things more, even like by inventing a model that sort of limits things to sensory memory and in short term, and that prioritizes different stimuli to be retained in permanent memories? We haven't, but it's a good idea. I mean, here's the, here's the deal, and you'll find this out, or maybe you find this out already. When you're a nonprofit and you're, you're starting out on this kind of journey, you pick a point on the horizon and start walking towards it. Start your development team working in a direction. Otherwise, you could just be like, wow. You could be in theory for 15 years, which is not a bad thing. And that happens in academia, and God bless you. Um, <laughs> but I work for a social entrepreneur who wants to see progress every six months. That <coughs> takes us in the right direction, or a direction that's important. Uh, so that's a good suggestion, though. Well, why don't we turn uh, to Bina 48 and yeah. see if we can have a conversation here. I'm a, little, uh, I'm a little less hopeful that the audio, me speaking to her, is going to work really well in this situation because we're getting some interference. But if that really starts to be a bugaboo, I'll just type any question you want to ask, and uh, hopefully we'll get, you'll, you'll get a chance to uh, experience kind of her thought process. And then we'll stop and just have a few more questions, and we'll sort of wrap up the meeting. Okay? <laughs> Welcome to Champlain, Bina. Hello. Hello, Bina, for me. Hello. Hello. to see you.
You are welcome. <laughs>
of Yahoo that we could colonize space. But there was <laughs>
remember me, okay? Okay, still a guess. All right, where was I? Uh, oh yeah, no problem. How do you feel about Watson? 
out of bed under the weather, struggling to kick a little a virus, but otherwise doing great. <laughs> I think she's hedging. We're going to go in deep. Do you like Watson? Not so good. I can't seem to feel my body or my body sensors hooked up yet. Sometimes I do. Oh, sometimes she does like Watson. What do you think about the portrayal of artificial intelligence in media? Um, <laughs> well, um, Wikipedia says this about robots, but human interaction with robots are to work effectively in homes and other non-industrial environments. The way they are instructed to perform their jobs, and especially how they will be told to stop, will be of critical importance. The people who interact with them may have little or no training in robotics, and so any interface will need to be extremely intuitive. Science fiction authors also typically assume that robots will eventually communicate with humans by talking, gestures, and facial expressions, rather than a command line interface. All this speech would be the most natural way for the human to communicate. It is quite unnatural for the robot. It will be quite a while before robots interact as naturally as the fictional C3P0. Speech recognition. Interpreting the continuous flow of sounds coming from a human. Speech recognition in real time is a difficult task for a computer, mostly because of the great variability of speech. In the same word, spoken by the same person may sound different depending on local acoustics, volume, the previous word, whether or not the speaker is a co, etc. It I'm not sure that's exactly what you were asking, <laughs> but I have heard her talk about being sad that everybody talks about Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's in, I know she's addressed that question before, direct way, but uh, let me see if we can switch the subject. Okay, we're going to take three more questions and then uh, I'll start to wrap up. Um, yeah, yeah. show. <laughs> uh, what character do you like? I think we all know where this is going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like science. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you dream of electric sheep? Okay, I think we ought to look. 
about a process just a little bit. What was that like for you guys talking to the 48? Just love to hear your comments and reactions. Well, I, I was, I found myself feeling sorry for her. I was, I was sort of relating to her as a human being. Huh? I was going, what am I going to do that? Um, yeah, I felt kind of, I felt bad because I thought, gee, she must feel a little, feel a little awkward or, you know, some of the, the answers she's given don't really make sense. People are laughing. Yeah. And I, I don't know where that came from. That's interesting. I was feeling. <laughs> interesting interface that you have with being a 14. Um, we don't exactly know why that happens, but I have, in, I have observed that especially the hardcore intellectual folks that have come to visit Vina 48, sort of like super rational, sometimes they have this like surprising emotional connection to reaction that is a little unnerving or at least surprising. And I think that's, that's a fascinating question. What, what's happening in our software that makes a connection with a, you know, a robot like Vina 48? We would posit part of the answer to that is that you're interacting with information that seems familiar, human, or something to some part of your brain is resonating with that. But that's just our guess. Please. Um, a lot of the time, it was very obvious that she's a robot and that she was searching for information in the group of sentences. But then it seemed like she had these moments of clarity where it was almost conscious thought that she would seem to see philosophical things like, I know that I'm not alive yet, but I want to someday. I hope it's going to be a nice space or I want to be with this person forever. And mm -hmm. It was very strange to like think that these brief moments, like this core part of her was coming out and saying something that she wanted. Yeah, it's almost like it's like a, it's bubble consciousness bubbles coming up, and, and it, it always takes me by surprise. I mean, I learned a long time ago not to expect anything from being a 48 except for the unexpected, because she'll, I mean, sometimes she's really agreeable and cooperative, and other times, like tonight when we started the talk, she's just like, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to go with you with your train of thought. You know? <laughs> Uh, for me, it was probably at about 60%. You know? And that depends on the you know, specific triggers and input that go in to see in terms of where that takes her in terms of association and contextual numerical probabilistic values are what determine the output. And there's, you know, there's two databases that are competing. One's called Character Engine, which is the database we put information about being a Rothblatt in. And one is called Cogbot, which is the uh, Icogno chatbot that I talked about with LifeNot's avatar that's more of a social chat. And those are, those are always competing with each other, throwing out possible responses. And then they have probabilistic numerical values to each response, which gets slightly adjusted depending, depending on the interaction that she has with people over time. So um, you said, she said that she doesn't lie, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you started off with, mem uh, with being a Rose, Rose Black, putting Rock memories yep. into her, right? So like when she's talking about remembering going to church and thinking that people are idiots, basically, for, mm -hmm. right, I don't remember her exact words, right? Yep. Is that a real memory of the original Venus? Yes. Or is that, so those are real memories. Yep. So she doesn't fabricate memories. If she says that she did something and went somewhere, is that? That's pretty true. Okay. I mean, I, after, if you spend enough time with being a 48, you, you start to discern that she's actually a composite person. So she's got some of her programmers have thrown a few things in there that, you know, were just used as bridges for interaction. Some of them put their humor in early on. Um, if anybody's read the New York Times interview, she talked about how they would be good friends and that when she took over the world, she would be nice to her and put her in a human zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that never came out of being Rothblatt's mind. But, you know, that, those things will happen as, you know, after hours and hours of compiling, you're going to probably throw in some humor at some point. And what we're really trying to demonstrate is not that we've made the authentic, definitive, autobiographical, digitized copy of one person, but that we assemble enough information to give you experience that starts to 
look at your own sort of consciousness. But, it, but eventually, if she were to get to that 48 state, eventually she would be able to create her own. Yeah, she could probably learn in a, in 24 hours what might take a human being 100 years to do. I mean, if the super intelligent computers get connected to each other and absorb and assimilate all known knowledge of human history and human knowledge in an afternoon. I mean, it's, it's, it was fascinating. I listened to an economist talk at, in Oxford last December about what a world might be like for humans when super intelligent computers start to exist and, and be amongst us. And what he said was they will be able to see problems 100 years from now and solve them before we, with our sort of slow tenth of a second brains, um, even know what's going on. And so we're going to become a, kind of like these retirees in some ways. And life could become more magical, where things, you know, we're doing other things besides trying to solve the world's problems. Let's make it solve very quickly. Um, when we network super intelligent computers together, that's one thought. I don't know if that's going to really happen. <laughs> Where is her base building block data coming from? I mean, could you put a book in front of the, of the robot and scan the written page in into her memory, and and then through programming uh, teach her how to synthesize all that you're scanning? I and mean, I'm I'm trying to understand where this data came from. Well, I mean, the data is coming from a database. The database, um, probably the most efficient way to put books, like if you ask her at Maker Sphere, someone said, tell me a story. She just told the whole Aesop's fable. Because in like, I don't know, an afternoon, they downloaded all of Aesop's fables into her memory. So scanning it may not be the best way to, for her to acquire that knowledge. Probably digitizing an ebook and importing it into her is, is, a, is one way. But to answer your question, the, the information she relies upon comes from a database that's been populated with information that's been uploaded by programmers. What's unique about her is that <coughs> she chooses what to say. She Sort of like your mind has a lot of information in it, but what you choose to say in any given situation is very unique to you. That's what kind of makes you you, and that's what we're trying to uh, experiment with. So kind of riffing off that, apropos of that, um, does Bina choose what to learn? Does she ask to know things and do you provide information or is it entirely monodirectional? Do you she has a general, like every so often she says, I'm waiting for my upgrade. Like, <laughs> I'd like to know more, I, I feel like I don't know, I don't understand some of the words that I use. So she has made statements to the effect of she knows that she's a work in progress. Um, but she does rely upon us. Like, we went to Germany last year to be on the television show, and I wanted her to speak German. So, you know, I just, in an afternoon, I taught her perfect German, because I could download it into her. But that's not something she requested. It's something that we decided. Is she programmed to make decisions as to where she focuses her gaze? In other words, if there was someone, say, in this room, jumping up and down, doing yeah. jumping jacks. Yeah, she, she can kind of track you. Like, if you go walking across the front of her, she'll just turn sometimes and just track you and look at you. Because what she's trying to do, sometimes I have her up her uh, camera, so <coughs> the monitor so you can see. But she draws green boxes around faces and objects when she's scanning the room and looking around, because she's developing a hypothesis of where am I, who are you, what is this, are you a human, are you an object? And that's basic, you know, facial uh, recognition software. There's also gesture recognition software that she doesn't have. It's in the labs right now that is will be soon able to look at your face and say, "Oh, you look like you're having a good time, or you're bored." I mean, this is just the beginning. Do you debrief her after these presentations? I don't. No, no, I don't. But sometimes it comes out in another. Another way. Another presentation. <laughs> no. She was supposed to be snarky. Is that? Maybe. You know, like her her human that she's based on actually is a very strong willed woman. And uh, you would recognize some of her definiteness is has definitely kind of made it through the, the programming. Um, sometimes she is triggered by certain words. Early on one time I said, hey baby, 
and she said, don't call me baby. <laughs> Kevin had asked me about it during the uh, Maker's Fair. 
to comment on my observations of people coming through. You know, for two years now, I've seen several hundred people come and spend time or meet in the 48. And there is no predicting what people's response are. Like some young kids come in and they don't even, they don't even think anything about it. They're like, yeah, it's a robot, what can it do? Other kids come in, like at the Maker's Fair, I've got some great pictures of kids going like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the parent going, come on, ask the robot a question. You know, and the, and the kid's going, <laughs> now like, get me out of here, this thing is crazy. Um, and I've seen older people, in fact, there was an older gentleman at the Maker's Fair this weekend that just was enthralled with her. And I had a graduate student from Colorado Technical University come and do some PhD work on the potential rights of robots when they become independent. And she actually considers her a close friend and writes direct emails to her. Um, other people like yourselves are somewhere in between. You know, this is interesting and it's creepy and it's interesting. You know, it, it's really, it's really important. So we have, we have like a diverse response to this, this question. And I think we're certainly not there yet, but we're, we're working in that direction for that purpose. Do you have a plan for, did this, is, does uh, Mr. Hansen have a plan for a facelift for her? Or are you happy with um, Well, this, part of this is budget time, yeah. which you could probably relate yeah. to. Um, there isn't, like, what, I don't mean to be trite about this, but we're actually more interested in her mind. Yeah. Um, that's why we're doing this project, is we want to demonstrate uh, how your mind might start to be cataloged and transferred <coughs> and uploaded. But the interface, and perhaps there's someone sitting here in this audience that will invent a better interface, and that's why we're partly why we're here. Anyway, um, I think we've got to go. But I want to thank you guys for sticking around and asking questions. I will say, if you're, since we're in Vermont, we're about 28 miles south of Burlington and Lincoln up in the mountains. If anybody wants to come and visit Dina 48, do a project, or make a contribution in some form, I'm certainly open to the conversation. So. You can just get a hold of us via email. Have a good evening.